A little over a month ago, I posted a video on the County of London plan to totally overhaul the railways of London, and I mentioned the city widened lines. I asked if people would like to know more, and you did, so here we go. The city widened lines, the underground line that didn't have underground trains but had just about every other kind of train, the abandoned line that runs through some of the busiest stations in London. The story begins with the Metropolitan Railway, which of course is now the Metropolitan Line. One of the big attractions of this line, one of the deciding factors in getting it built, was how useful it would be for other railways. Originally it was built to run from Paddington to Farringdon. In 1865, two years after opening, it was extended to Moorgate. Along the way it connected with the Great Western Railway at Paddington, the London and North Western Railway at Euston, and the Great Northern Railway at King's Cross. There was also a plan to connect to the Midland Railway at St Pancras. The Regent's Canal ran through King's Cross, and the Grand Union Canal had a basin at Paddington. And Smithfield, of course, had an enormous meat market. The whole thing was an absolute gold mine, right? Well, strangely enough, the railway companies were a little reluctant to chip in for the construction of the Metropolitan, and it wasn't until the railway was complete that they actually saw the potential. It almost goes without saying that the line was immediately popular. It was rapid transit through the heart of London. In 1866, it gained another connection with the London Chatham and Dover Railway. The London Chatham and Dover owned Blackfriars Station, although back then Blackfriars Station was called St Paul's. The London Chatham and Dover built a tunnel under Snow Hill to give them a link to the Metropolitan. The London Chatham and Dover weren't a company with a lot of money, but they figured it was worth the investment. Connecting to the Met meant that they owned a connection between Northern and Southern England, very useful and very lucrative. And so a plan was put in place to extend the Metropolitan Line sideways, to build two extra tracks between Moorgate and King's Cross, alongside the existing ones, specifically for the convenience of other railway companies wanting to use the Metropolitan Railway's route. It would require a new tunnel through Clerkenwell, and became known as the City Widened Lines, or the Widened Lines to its friends. The new tracks opened in 1868. The Great Northern Railway connected with the widened lines from their main line via two separate tracks at King's Cross. The track down to the tunnels had its own station, York Road. Why they felt they needed another station right next to the main King's Cross, I don't know. Especially since you could only use it in one direction. The other track, the one that headed out into the open, was a fearsomely steep section of track, known as the Hotel Curve, which could bring heavy trains to a standstill and even cause them to slide back into the Stygian gloom. Incidentally, there's a bit of confusing railway terminology at work here. In railway terms, the line in the direction of central London is always referred to as the up line. So here, the line down to the widened lines is the up line, and the down line goes up. Do you see the kind of nonsense I have to deal with? Anyway, you can now visit the old King's Cross goods yard, which is now Coal Drops Yard. While I'm in the area, here's the site of St Pancras goods yard. Part of it is under the Francis Crick Institute, but this row of shops is very obviously associated with the station, you can tell from the architecture. You can still ride part of the widened lines. The section between King's Cross and Farringdon is now used by Thameslink, and if you do, look out of the window. Here you can see the remains of the Metropolitan Railway's King's Cross station. This was abandoned, then revived as King's Cross Thameslink. Then it was replaced by St Pancras International in 2007, giving it the rare distinction of being a station that's been abandoned twice. However, the old entrance is still in use as an alternative entrance to the underground. The London Chatham and Dover's bit connected just before Farringdon as we head east, but they got a bit carried away with their section of line. As well as their station at St Paul's, Blackfriars remember, in 1865 they built a station at Ludgate Hill. In 1874 they built one for Hoban Viaduct. 
Ludgate Hill and Hoban Viaduct were so close together that the modern City Thameslink actually covers both sites. This exit is where Hoban Viaduct was, and this one is where Ludgate Hill was. Ludgate Hill Station closed in 1929, which will come as a surprise to no one. Anyway, Thameslink uses this section of line now, albeit somewhat rebuilt. I mean, technically this wasn't part of the widened lines, but it's all part of the same basic thing. Just after Farringdon, we come to Smithfield Market. The Midland, Great Northern and Metropolitan Railways all had goods depots in the area, but the one I find particularly interesting is the Great Western Railway. In the 1860s, Smithfield Meat Market was being rebuilt. I did a video on Smithfield, which I'll link in the description below. But what this reconstruction meant was that they could incorporate a railway goods depot directly underneath the market. You can still visit the depot, sort of. It's now the underground car park, reached by the same spiral ramp the carts used in the Victorian era. The final two stations were Barbican and Moorgate. Unfortunately, if you want to follow them by rail, you'll have to take the tube. In 2009, as part of the Thameslink programme, the platforms at Farringdon were extended to allow 12 coach trains. That resulted in the section of the widened lines from here to Moorgate being cut off. So now you have what must be the most visible section of abandoned railway in London. It's in plain sight at Moorgate and Barbican. I've often thought it would be a cool place to store heritage stock from the London Transport Museum's collection, but that's probably not practical. In their heyday, the widened lines would have been a train spotter's paradise if train spotters had been invented. Trains ran through these tunnels to all sorts of destinations, both in London and further afield. There was even a service from Liverpool to Paris via the Channel ports. Special locomotives were built or acquired by the mainline railway companies to work the widened lines, fitted with condensers. These were devices that took the steam exhaled by the locomotive, condensed it and discharged it back into the tanks. Locomotive size was limited by the line's tight curves and clearances, but nevertheless the Great Northern Railway built these chunky lads to work the line. As was so often the case with railways, the line's fortunes changed over the 20th century. Ironically, this was partly due to the rise of the underground network, which offered a quicker and more convenient route into the city for many commuters. Although the lines were a vital artery during both world wars, the second half of the century saw a decline in goods trains, with Smithfield Depot closing in 1962. Lorries had poached much of the railway's traffic, and the rest was to be sent via the West London line. In 1970, Snow Hill Tunnel closed, in 1976, the old Great Northern approaches to the lines, where down means up and up means down, were also closed, along with York Road Station. But it wasn't the end. There never really was an end, in fact. In 1988, Thameslink opened. This is a major commuter route whose core section in London reuses the London Chatham and Dover section and part of the widened lines. This line is so busy and so useful that it's now included on the tube map, which I think is a real testament to the vision of the Metropolitan Railway. The purpose has changed, the routes have changed, but a line built over 150 years ago is still serving London. Hello all, I hope you enjoyed this widened tale from the tube. If you did, there's a like button that you might like to click and you may wish to subscribe for more like this as well as sharing with your friends, family, significant others, and insignificant others. I'm just going to end with a question. I talk a lot about different railway companies in this and other videos, but I never really have time to go into detail about them, which I think is a shame. If you're a railway enthusiast, then you know what I mean by Great Northern Railway, Midland Railway, or whatever, but if you're not, those names mean nothing. What I've been playing with is the idea of a sort of mini-series of quick introduction videos to the different railway companies. Where they went, what they carried, what their public image was like, etc. Just a quick intro to each company for the benefit of people who aren't necessarily hardcore train nuts like me, but who might like a bit more context for when I mention these things. Anyway, is that something you'd be interested in? Let me know if that's something you might enjoy in the comments.
and I'll see you again very soon for another tale from the tube.